The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. Um, we are, wow, this is a double header today and we started at uh, 12 noon Eastern time with a great session on the ecology of, an ecology of communication with Nora Bateson and Diane Mushaw Hamilton. And today, and I'm going to ask them to write their correct name. I don't know why that happened, but uh, our, our guest today, uh, this afternoon, are, is uh, Zach Stein and Daniel Smochtenberger. Uh, for some reason, the default uh, is my name, is. but I did not do that. <laughs> so um, I'm going to hand it over to, to Greg, double G and uh, let him take it from here in terms of setting the stage. Amen. Well, it's a real honor to be here. Uh, I'm super psyched. I get to touch with my good friend, Zach Stein, uh, and get to have a uh, hear from Daniel Smochtenberger, one of my um, real leading forces and leading edges uh, in society, as far as I'm concerned right now, that I follow. So um, I'm super excited for us to talk about the we the I, the it, um, think about what it is that we are doing as a collective, reflect on our epistemics and our values and the direction of our education. Um, and so uh, I'd like to welcome Daniel. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us. I'm just enjoying the comment thread. It's actually really great right now. <laughs> cool, uh, cool. Good way to start. Good to and see everybody here. Thanks for having me. I, Rain, I didn't hear you today. It's good to see you. Cool, cool. And Zach, uh, welcome to you also. Yeah, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm excited. This is a hell of a jam we've got set up here. Absolutely, man. So what, what I'd like to do is play a clip from Daniel's recent conversation with Brett Weinstein a long conversation, a uh, three hour conversation, but there was a portion that just jumped out at me because it reflected on the very theme of our session. And it's within two minutes, but as Daniel does, there's a lot packed in that <laughs> two minutes. So I wanna play that. And then, and this is similar to what we did earlier, Daniel, you frame the song but first we're gonna start with comments by Zach, Double G, Greg Enriquez and myself, and then have you come in. So we, you're gonna hear us sing on your song and then you come in, how's that feel? I like it being facilitated by a jazz guy. <laughs> <laughs> cool, <laughs> all right. So let me screen share and let everybody see what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And the only answer out of the oppression or chaos is the comprehensive education of everyone in the capacity to understand at least three things. They have to increase their first person, second person, and third person epistemics. Their third person epistemics is the easiest. Philosophy of science, formal logic, their ability to actually make sense of base reality through appropriate methodology and find appropriate confidence margin. Second person is my ability to make sense of your perspective. Can I steel man where you're coming from? Can I inhabit your position well? And if I'm not oriented to do that, then I'm not gonna find the synthesis of a dialectic. I'm gonna be arguing for one side of partiality, harming something that will actually harm the thing I care about in the long run. And then first person, can I notice my own biases and my own susceptibilities and my own group identity issues and whatever well enough that those aren't the things that run me. When I look at kind of the ancient Greek enlightenment, the first person was the Stoic tradition. 
the second person was the Socratic tradition. The third person was the Aristotelian tradition. Mm -hmm. There's a mirror of all those in modernity. We need a new cultural enlightenment now that where everyone values good sense making about themselves, about others, about base reality, and good quality dialogue with other people that are also sense making to emerge to a collective consciousness and collective intelligence that is more than our individual intelligence. And with so that we have some basis of something that isn't chaos, but that also isn't oppression because it's emergent more than imposed. So it's like it's cultural enlightenment or bust as far as I'm concerned. All right. So I don't. Okay. It's cultural enlightenment or bust. Bust. <laughs> Quite a statement. Damn. <laughs> so I would like Zach to riff on that. And then double G, Greg Enriquez, and then I'll say a little something, something, and then we'll go from there. Totally. Uh, I mean, this is the core of the, you know, almost the year long work Daniel and I've been doing uh, with the Consilience Project. And in many ways, the root of our collaboration and you know, the root of a lot of the work that I do as an educational philosopher. I didn't put it in terms of cultural enlightenment. I put it in terms of that we're an educational crisis. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it's a deep diagnostic point and reason for hope, I think, for the future. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, there's a lot of things to say specifically. I will say that a cultural enlightenment doesn't mean the modern enlightenment, <laughs> right? So it's important not to mistake it for what Greg calls men's, which is the modern enlightenment, natural science, which, which would be one third of what Daniel spoke to, right. right? That we need actually a different kind of more comprehensive cultural enlightenment, um, which, you know, there's historical precedent. The, when Daniel speaks to the education of everyone, right? This is a, one of the great dignities of modernity. Um, and I attributed to uh, John Amos Comenius, who I've spoken about on the stove before and spoken with Greg about. And it is that notion of um, the basis of new social reality, beginning with culture, specifically with the life of the ideas that live between us. Um, and so yeah, and, and the first person, second person, third person framing, of course, is resonant with my metapsychological model with development, ensoulment, and transcendence, and the notion that there's a kind of a, for lack of a better uh, sh sh shorthand, an up leveling necessary across each of those three modalities, which needs to be facilitated by kind of like techno social education centric reform at a very broad scale. And so that's a big project, <laughs> but it begins with realizing that this is the project to do, that it's fundamentally educational work that needs to be done first in the interest of something like uh, an enlightenment. Um, and if you look around, these are the times in which enlightenments arise. <laughs> Liminality, times of chaos, uh, when convention both breaks down and is reified and locked in, right? Um, so these are the age of Comenius was that the Thirty Years' War and that route between the Renaissance and what we call the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment. Um, so, yeah, it's a deep. It speaks to me if I'm thinking of a song. This is a deep, deep set of chord changes, <laughs> uh, which are, um, uh, yeah, deep enough to bring multiple types of collaborative elements on top of. And this isn't a narrow thing that's hard to improvise with. This is actually a large statement that can galvanize a, a bunch of different endeavors. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm glad you guys started with that. I'll leave it there because there's much, much else to say. So I think Greg would go next, double G. Yeah, there is a lot to say. It's a beautiful clip. Um, I think if we, if I now at the days think about the educational process I tend to think about it as skill development, ensoulment, and transcendence, um, which is another tripartite that I know uh, that Zach has educated me on in ways of thinking about our own development. Um, when I place it in my own context, you know, I'm embedded in American psychology, um, and I talk often about the problem 
of psychology, and really it's a problem of American psychology. And I believe that the problem of American psychology actually can be traced back to the Enlightenment uh, and its fundamental confusion about the first person, second person, and third person. Uh, the process by which we generated a third person matter in motion epistemics and how that scientific message and epistemology got dominant and then how we didn't know how to sync it up to a first and second person way of being in the world is absolutely essential. And I think in relationship to this enlightenment, if we are going to be so bold, is to fundamentally create an opportunity to educate around all three perspectives, to appreciate which each of those epistemic frames is about, and to begin to generate sense-making systems that allow us to cohere. And I did, just as you note, uh, I think that failure to do that um, is deeply, <laughs> deeply dangerous. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you both Zach and Greg Double G. So I'll, I'll, I'll put it in, in terms of a, an idea that I have been developing of late cultural intelligence. So in the course that I actually taught through the Aligned Center um, this past fall into winter, there were three parts. The first part was cultural literacy. So what is culture? What does it mean? What does culture do, right? I also decoupled culture from race. Mm. So the, co the course was actually called Cultural Intelligence Transcending Race Embracing Cosmos. Mm. And I did that move specifically because mixing up race and culture has gotten us into all kinds of trouble uh, since at least uh, late 1600s. <laughs> also, cultural literacy has to do with understanding certain developmental models, both for a person and for societies and civilizations and groups. I'll just leave it there. But I know almost everyone on this call knows what I'm alluding to. There's different names and different models. Then we need some case studies. And in the course, I, I used Western culture, American culture, and Black American culture as the case studies of culture in action. And then in the last part, I made it into the the personal, the, the, the more I part of the I, we, it, and to deal with certain issues with cognition and emotions, and then with shadow and cultural somatics, a need for us to deal with the reality of trauma and integrating that so that we can move forward and develop in various ways. And then a spiritual vision, you know, your, your ensoulment, Zach, um, I think is a key part of that, where we embrace um, a more cosmic vision. Now, that may sound woo-woo, but I mean it in more of a philo philosophical sense, like rooted cosmopolitanism. We can have a rooted identity or rooted identities, but we also at the same time can be citizens of the world and citizens of the cosmos. That's where we come from. We're star stuff. So... I think cultural intelligence, what I'm calling cultural intelligence, is a part of this cultural enlightenment that I totally agree is necessary. So that's my comment. And now we hand it over to the man himself who made the statement, Daniel. Well, I don't think I said anything particularly original in that statement, but maybe it was a, a good starting place. Uh, describing the need for a philosophy that is first, second, and third person. I think many people have done. I heard it from Ken first uh, as a college. Um, the couple of thoughts that come to mind first is that the, th the thing that I'm saying is necessary is actually not all that lofty like an integrated metaphysics that actually gets beyond 
the or properly addresses the subject object distinction and the limit of the distinctions between first, second and third person and formalizes all that like that would be nice, but that that's that's not needed when I talk about second person epistemology I'm talking about some very basic shit, which is can I try to get where someone else is coming from and do a decent job of actually trying to inhabit what it's like to be them and what how they're seeing things can I try to steal man it rather than straw man it like this is a very basic capacity, but almost completely non-existent in the public sphere currently. When I talk about the first person, very, very deep nuanced phenomenological insights are not that needed. It's like, can I pay attention to where I have motivated reasoning? Mm. And I really want the answer to be one thing as opposed to something else. And I want to be right. And, you know, like I'm not that earnest. Can I just pay attention to and value my own earnestness enough? Um, and then with third person, again, it's like, before I share something on Facebook about the virus, do I know what a virus is? As opposed to a bacteria or an exosome, like just do I have the basic shit about what I'm talking about? And if not, just study more a little bit. So um, I, I would like an integrated metaphysics. I would like to move in that direction, but I would like more people that can hold uncertainty about the hard questions while being able to advance the basic stuff well. <clears throat> I think sometimes the desire to be able to formalize the metaphysics actually comes from a certain uncomfort with uncertainty and wanting to be able to have some perfected or totalizing knowledge. And I'd rather people who are like, I don't know lots of fundamental things about the nature of consciousness and its interaction with matter and if it's purely computational or not or whatever, but I can try to get your perspective. And then I can try to synthesize the partial values and the perspectives to see how to move forward. When um, the famous saying by von Clausewitz that war is politics by other means, the key is actually the opposite side of that statement, that politics is how you sublimate warfare We're, for people who actually want different things and value different things and have different sense-making of reality. So, and, and warfare is so nasty and people who haven't lived through it have such a bad intuition about how nasty it is that to get that coming to compromise is actually a really important thing. So I want to be able to under, I can't just demonize the other people, try to get a short win and keep driving cultural arms races and actually get anywhere good. I've got to try to understand where they're coming from well enough that we can find some common ground because all the other answers suck. And that for us to be able to remake open society institutions that derive their power from the consent of the governed, the governed in order to consent have to understand the issues. And so that means that they, there has to be a culture that values understanding these things enough that we invest in it enough that that's possible. And that's what I mean by a cultural enlightenment. That's great. That's great. And I love how, <laughs> Um, as abstract and detailed as you can get, I love the fact that you're like, this is basically what it is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we can put various labels on it, but if we can get people to steal man, if we can get people to, um, as John Verveke says, do, you know, self-correction, question their own shit, um, and look at what you call base reality, that's where it is. But like you said, in the public sphere, in the public square, this is, is so little um, there, though there are, as Zach implied, there are various movements going on and, and groups of people that are doing this. So one of the things we tried to do for this series is actually start with consilience. We started with a session called From Matter to Life to Mind to Culture, where we had a physicist, an evolutionary biologist, a psychologist, Greg Double G, and myself dealing with culture. Usually those domains don't engage in conversation. So that was our attempt, attempt to actually model that. What I like to ask you and Zach Daniel, is for the Consilience Project that you've been working on for a year and that should be seeing the light of day pretty soon. 
Um, what can you tell us about what we should be looking out for and what we can expect? Because um, it's a it's a real big deal, and I want to honor you and Zach and others who are working on this project for having the courage to take a heroic step to not only analyze not only what's wrong, but how civilization is going down the tubes, but taking the step of trying to do something about it to make sure it doesn't happen. So I want to thank you for that. Yeah, I think one just theoretical thing I want to say, because um, I forgot to say it, and I think it's a, a bit important. I, I just got off speaking with a group of uh, retired congressmen, and they were talking about uh, not just the breakdown in education and civics, but any kind of cultural value in civic engagement or the moral development that's associated. And you know, when you read the founding documents here and any kind of thoughtful open society philosophy will say something similar is that there is a moral education along with the epistemic education that's required because a democratic system of governance means a process of collective choice making where we all participate in making some choice as opposed to have some ruler make it for us. And the choice is informed both by what we value and what we think is and the effect will be. So the epistemics is what is, what will the effect of the injunction be or the activity be, but the, there's also the values part. And every system had some way of being able to bind the well-being of the individual and the well-being of the collective at various scales. Tribes obviously had to have that. And religion was a method of doing that. And patriotism was a method of doing that, that uh, my sense of being able to have honor was bound to duty, right? That there was a connection. And obviously for a bunch of reasons, some unfortunate, some legitimate things like religion and patriotism have kind of waned deeply as have local community identities. And, and the market idea, right? The kind of Randian idea was just pure greed what creates the greatest good for everybody because I only get ahead in the market if I produce a good or service that other people really want that benefits their life at a better value that the rational economic actor consumes. Mm -hmm. And of course, behavioral economics showed us that that was utter gibberish because we can manufacture demand for nonsense and, sh and it's way easier to make money through extraction than actual production and lots of other things. And yet that meant the the idea of binding the way the individual gets ahead with some kind of collective value was broken. And the kind of market ideology said the invisible hand will just magically create good and it doesn't. And so that kind of values base of culture, you, you can see that it's missing, right? Like right now, neither the left nor the right have a value on understanding each other. They just have a value on appealing to their own base and demonizing each other. Um, that was just one thing I wanted to add. Well, thank you for adding that. I mean, our, our second session was values as energetic transcendence. Mm -hmm. So we are really trying to, you know, hit to, to play the core changes that are that are really needed. Um, so thank you for that, that addition. Zach, would you like to, to come on in back? Yeah, absolutely. And to, and to get your question, Greg, I mean, generally when one is writing a book wasn't, and it hasn't been released yet, one doesn't speak too much about it, but I can say that's a couple of, you know, sense I don't want to jinx it, but yeah, yeah, yeah. at the same time, it, there are some things that can be said in general, you know, which are that, um, you know, it's, it's an educational project aimed at the foundations of um, our shared social understanding. Uh, and so the focus is in many ways, the media the news, right? And what, what's happening in the context of the way that the world and its complexity is staged for us by the media, right? That the media gives us resources for sense-making and these resources are insufficient. And so some of what we're doing is pointing that out, but only in the context of equipping people <laughs> with ways to uh, both ask more of their uh, resources uh, in terms of like what they're getting to actually put a different kind of demand on the media, uh, but also to allow for the convergence of a, of a movement around this shared sense that we're in an, in an informational crisis, akin to like an ecological crisis. Mm -hmm. So 
Uh, and there is an information ecology, of course. And there's an information ecology, precisely. So the idea would be that <clears throat> there's kind of a founding move that needs to be made here in drawing attention to this, the crisis in the information ecosystem. Uh, and there are a group of people who already identify as those who are seeking to uh, save the informational ecosystem, <laughs> to save reason and uh, truth, goodness, beauty, um, things of that nature, uh, and discourse, communication, um, perspective taking, the simple civic virtues that Daniel was speaking to, which are not a given, which do not necessarily emerge with, e with each new generation. They must be educated for. And so, yeah, so it is that. It is um, part media literacy, um, part uh, advanced situational assessment, um, but larger part education and capacity building and um, model offering to and it, it, to make that first move to to create a catalyst that can have ramifications into something like a broader cultural enlightenment, not a lofty <laughs> new metaphysics, but in fact just new forms of civic virtue that get us out of this uh, death spiral basically, as, which is what we're in as a culture. Absolutely. When you say new forms, um, will they be new or will they be, is it a question of like what from what is in the past do we need to right. take forward? What do we need to let go of? And then what innovative forms can we mm -hmm. come up with? Because certain things yeah. that we have let go we need to reclaim. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Be specific. <laughs> be yeah, no, very... we're we're in like a we're in like a post-conventional, post-institutional moment where we are exactly being asked to um, vet those aspects of convention for what they're worth. <laughs> uh, and so it's not that we're creating something whole cloth new. We're in right. fact rescuing the virtues of modernity and pre-modernity. <laughs> And uh, right, right. jettisoning, jettisoning, jettisoning those that uh, need to be like because they didn't have computers, and printing presses, <laughs> uh, and other things. But the virtue, in a sense, was basic. Um, and so again, Comenius, right? Uh, Bishop of the Bohemian Brethren, it's deeply mystical, uh, but uh, ecumenical, uh, uniting, trying to bring a sense of conciliance uh, during war. So yeah, so there's a there's a very deep educational catalyst that's trying to be created. So I'll pause. Great, come on in at, at any time. Huh? Yeah, actually, Daniel, I was wondering uh, if you would just share some of what you see as really hopeful uh, about uh, the consilient. Where do you see? There's a lot of catastrophic risk. Um, where are you seeing some of the most hopeful opportunities? I think it's been getting kind of surfaced here that uh, there are things already happening that are signs of a nascent movement to a cultural enlightenment that just doesn't recognize itself yet. And so if you look at Tristan Harris and Center for Humane Technology and all the groups that are looking at the way that there are unhealthy aspects of how the information ecosystem works, social media, et cetera, and working to address that, that's already a movement to identify how sense making is broken, how the fourth industrial revolution is not being rightly directed for open society or, or even a networked society. But it's just thinks that it's focused on the social media problem. And then there are other groups that are focused on perverse incentive in journalism and trying to fix some of the perverse incentive in journalism to not have to have clickbaity titles and really short salacious things. And there are other groups that are focused on how to get better education and civics to high school, but they don't all realize that they're part of the same project, right? That those are all focused on where there is, where there are things that are actively damaging public sense making and or where there's a need for further development of it. So one of the things we're seeking to do is to 
identify all the groups that are doing good work that is ultimately around that and to be able to curate and upregulate the signal to those and reframe them as not just education or journalism or social media or identifying Twitter botnets or whatever, but as parts of this cultural enlightenment where you move away from the kind of SDG focus of here's all the stuff the world should do, right? The world should coordinate to do these things. And you realize, well, we should have done nuclear disarmament and we have not ever done that. And we should have done the SDGs back when they were called the Millennium Development Goals. We couldn't do them. Like, why do we suck at doing big global things that are critical? And as we move into increasing catastrophic risk, that's more problematic. Mm -hmm. Upstream from the question of what should the world do is how do we coordinate better at all? Mm -hmm. The really critical things at scale. Mm -hmm. And upstream from how do we coordinate better is how do we make sense of reality and communicate effectively? Just prerequisites. So what we're looking at is what are the missing prerequisites that make coordination possible, that make all of the goals worth having possible. Mm. That's great. That's really great. Um, one of the things that I'd like to bring to our discussion is what was mentioned before regarding you know civic values. Um, I am very strongly influenced by the work of Ralph Ellison and Albert Murray, mm. both of whom were um, very high modernists, and I think proto integralist, and you can even say proto metamodernist. And both of them had a strong allegiance to the principles of uh, American democracy. Um, based on what Ellison called our sacred documents, Constitution, Declaration of Independence, Bill of Rights. Now, for some who hear that, who um, perhaps are from the postmodern progressive perspective, there may be a cynicism that arises because, you know, yeah, you can talk all that you all you want to, but we know that that stuff, you know, isn't isn't true, hasn't been true, particularly for certain groups of people. And I happen to look like uh, the group of people that they're referring to. But Ellison and Murray not only acknowledged that reality, they also had the consciousness and the awareness that having that beacon of light, that beacon of possibility that's represented in those documents and the values and virtues of those documents is an energetic force in and of itself to move you towards it. So even if it's by inch by inch by inch and then there's regression and then there's, that's the reality, you still have something to agree upon that we're moving towards. And if you can agree upon that, then we have somewhat of a common ground. And you also have a need for a higher ground based on new developmental and post-conventional reality. We have that too, but we need, I think, common and higher ground. And they were really aware of that. So um, we're gonna have to re-embrace some of those old liberal values. And I don't mean liberal, I, I mean classic liberal, you know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to bring that because I think that is really important to voice. Zach, Daniel. Totally. I mean, <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, there's so many directions to go with that. The, well, the first thing I'll say is that there's a, I'll go theoretical because it's easier for me anyway. <laughs> there's this issue in developmental psychology, which can be, kind of like transferred onto the scheme of, of historical development, which is like transitional and enduring structures and development, that there are these themes which emerge over multiple developmental levels over multiple years of your life, which continue to be perennial themes, which you actually deepen, right? So like fairness hmm. on, the, on the playground, fairness is about how many M&Ms does each kid get? Like literally count the M&Ms or Johnny will freak out. And he does because it's not fair if he gets fewer, um, unless there's stipulations because he's smaller or whatever, but there's agreed upon fairness. This thing emerges all, <laughs> all the way through adolescence. And then if you study philosophy and you read John Rawls, you get a principled conception of fairness, right? So this issue of 
as history unfolds, uh, there is going to be in retrospect, a lot of hypocrisy because earlier renditions of a perennial theme were, you know, understandably uh, limited in their first or second or third or fifth or hundredth articulation, because this thing will not stop being unpacked, that the things we think constitute justice now and medicine now and science now, 50 years from now, they'll look back on it and be like, whoa, dark age, yikes. <laughs> um, and yet they will still be pursuing something like science, justice, right? Human flourishing, hopefully, if we, if we succeed, right? And so there's this question of, yeah, how do we retrospectively uh, render to our ancestors trust in the judgment that they had, that they were actually doing the best with what was given to them? And then how do we see when in fact that wasn't the case and there was evil and there was mistakes, right? And so, and that's a polarity, but there's all of these shades of gray in between about the complexity of rendering moral judgment to the past and also the relationship between generations. Um, and so it's a deep issue that we are now grappling with. Um, part of becoming, I think, hopefully a more mature species is that attempt at the full remembrance of who you are, similar to what happens when you mature as a person, right? That like at a certain point, you got to start dealing with your shit. And uh, if you don't, you will limit your future possibilities by a lot, your future relationships, your the development of future capacities. So there's a reckoning that happens with maturation and with capacity development and a whole bunch of other things. And so I'm kind of superimposing that as a historical lens, but it's useful, broad brushstrokes to think like, yes, you know, we, this is apocalyptic in the sense of everything being revealed, that this is a time when we're trying to grapple uh, with the full extent of history, right? It was a Joyce uh, waking up from the nightmare of history. Um, mm. uh, and so, yeah, so I don't think it's trivial, but I, uh, to say um, that one believes in the founding vision of the United States. Um, and, and I, but I think it's an important thing that we're gonna to have to figure out what, what we, <laughs> meaning people who live within the geometric, ge you know, people who are in the United States system, what we think about that kind of phrase, because um, that kind of phrase is actually tearing us apart. And uh, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll leave it there, but it's a deep, again, you hit a deep chord there <laughs> and one that's gonna like resonate across a whole spectrum of response. And someone in the chat put, um, the um, Our Declaration by Danielle Allen, Harvard political philosopher, who's one of my very favorite. Um, she's incredible. And um, I want to thank that person for, for mentioning that because I want to voice her. I'm also wondering, Zach, um, how does your metapsychology fit within the educational project? I mean, I, it's in so far as I'm having an impact on how uh, the conceiving and executing of the project is going. It's it's completely woven in. I I don't think it will ever be something we explicitly teach. I mean, I don't I don't know, but I doubt it. But it is certainly part of the way we're thinking about it. Yeah, I mean, you know, for example, um, image, right? Uh, visual literacy. Uh, as an aspect of media literacy uh, is huge. And this is something I talk about with our editor in chief a lot is the nature of the imagery uh, and the way image captures personality, right? Words capture development, mind, skill. Image captures personality. That's why the image of a man being kneeled on so much more powerful than just the words of a man being kneeled on, right? right. And so the repetitive, repeated, re-traumatizing playing of the image in the media landscape is like, kind of like a psychological torture that we submit ourselves to um, because we're addicted to it. And so there's a, there's a lot of things in the aspect of insolment that actually uh, are being addressed, but not head on. <laughs> we're not like, we're working on insolment, but we're actually working on personality, character, uh, value. Um, and some of that will be not in the words, but how the words are presented, that the medium becomes the message that 
the nature of the design uh, and the imagery and those kinds of choices, as opposed to it just being a cognitive, uh, linguistically mediated project. And then of course, because as Daniel was saying, we're curating the space, we're trying to bring in the best of what we can find and build a movement. A lot of my concern as a psychologist is has nothing to do with what people are thinking and everything to do with what people are feeling <laughs> and the way they're processing their emotions and relationships. And so I'm gonna be trying to pay a lot of attention to those groups that are looking at the psychological and emotional precursors to even being interested in <laughs> civil conversation. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, so yeah, so there's a lot to do in these in these arenas. So in that sense, I think it's, in, it's, it's very much informing the project, but uh, it's one of many models that are being uh, used to uh, shape the project. Daniel, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, you know, sort of how you're thinking about ethics and values in relationship to the project. And is it fair to say, I noticed your conversation with Brett uh, when you got on this, uh, wove in and out with sort of issue, foundational issues of value. So if we think about the three points of view and also then think about the foundational values that we can be guided around. Um, that to me always is, seems to be a, a super important um, place to find and create common ground. Uh, and I see my friend Mike Muscolo here has uh, built a frame around how to understand need and value. So I just wonder if you could offer some reflection about uh, value-based discourse. Um, I'll start by taking something that Zach was just saying, where he was discussing uh, how media is affecting people traumatically or emotionally in addition to cognitively. And just uh, a decision that we had to make around that uh, and how it reflected a value that we hold. And then I'll get into the deeper question. Early in the process, there was a branding team that came on to help us. And they're like, what emotions do you want to evoke with the site? And I'm like, none. I don't want to evoke emotions. This is the whole fucking point is that that's actually the thing we're trying to cure is figuring out how to use scientific split tested optimization of images and whatever to evoke emotions for some kind of purpose. I actually, if anything, I would want to evoke an emotion using a technique, then show people how we did it. <laughs> Right. Just like do the magic trick and show them and say, this is what is happening to you all the time. Here's someone on the left doing it. Here's someone on the right doing it. Here's the market doing it. Here's a religious leader doing it. Now fucking go look for this everywhere and have more immune system to this kind of mimetic manipulation. Right. So cultural engineering, the goal of it usually is how do we control the thinking, feeling, values, and ultimately behavior of a lot of people towards some specific vested interest. Our goal is cultural engineering of a different type, which is how do we make all of that first type of cultural engineering not work anymore? Our goal is to obliterate the effectiveness of narrative, mimetic, and info warfare. And in order to do that, it's how to, and it's an asymmetric war currently. It's, you know, trillion dollar companies against a person who doesn't even realize they're engaging. So it's how do we equip people better to recognize when those things are happening. How can we equip them to notice when Russell conjugation and Lakoff framing is happening or when mm -hmm. statistical cherry picking of data is happening, when conflation is happening, and also when the right kind of imagery and evocative dynamics are being used. Um, so there's a value embedded in that for us, which is seeking to increase the I mean, it, it corresponds to when, uh, Greg, you were saying liberalism earlier and what the core of it means that the idea of promoting liberty and the sovereignty of the individual, how do we actually increase the sovereignty of the individual against asymmetric forces seeking to co-opt it? Um, because to the degree that we can get better and better causal mechanisms to affect other people's choice, we're actually debasing the reality of their choice. And an ethical system, what it, however we figure it out, is a system for making the right kinds of choices, but it doesn't mean we take away other people's choices. So to the degree that I compelled someone into an ethical choice, it's no longer ethical. Right. To, so our goal is how do we actually help nurture the growth of people who think and reflect deeply on these things and want to 
and want to talk with and listen to other people who mm-hmm. are also thinking on them. And we don't have to have an absolute ethical system. Like, you know, most ethical systems have reducto ad absurdum applications that show where they become nonsense. If your goal is a negative utilitarian and you want to minimize suffering, you should kill the universe because there's suffering in the universe, right? Mm -hmm. And there's each of those different, every form of utilitarianism has some weird edge cases like that. So do values, ethics. Mm -hmm. And so again, there is a fundamentalism I'm not seeking. I'm seeking people who can, who can ground abstractions and felt sense and have a certain trust of their own reasoning and a trust of other people's reasoning to come to what the best emergent thing they can move forward with is. We were talking with Nora Bateson uh, today, and I'm sure this is what Greg would want to hook you up on, but uh, you know, her narrative around warm data um, yeah. and the, the context of the influence that you have inside of it in relation and attending to not the formulaic, but the echoes of impact and the capacity to have grace and um, sort of participatory flow in whatever that kind of system is that rather than prescribing some complicated ethical code, you have to be very, very wary of, of those kinds of things. So I'm, I'm hearing you infuse that aliveness and reflexivity uh, in the best sense in terms of the kinds of propagating values that would enable us. Nora's work with warm data is one of the things that I hope we can signal boost mm-hmm. because she's looking at complexity from the embodied standpoint. So not kind of uh, the mathematics that are studied at Santa Fe Institute, but the complexity of how many different contexts and perspectives and nuance people can inhabit in the way they approach anything. And I think it's, it's more relevant to actual choice making. Specifically though, any ethical system that gets formalized and optimized, I believe becomes a paperclip maximizer. And I'm particularly concerned with, as people pursue enlightenment ideas and they go more rational, you get instrumental rationality and utilitarian or consequentialism, and you can do the worst evil things in the name of utilitarian ethics, because if I'm sure that the trolley is going to kill a hundred people, if I don't do anything, then of course I'm justified in making it for sure kill one person. But the real trolley problems that we're trying to make decisions about have way more uncertainty. They involve complexity where we say, okay, well, I'm sure that AGI is going to emerge in 20 years. And I'm sure that it's going to uh, get rid of all hydrocarbon life based on the von Neumann Morgenstern decision-making principle and blah, blah, blah. Therefore I need to um, chip people's brains right now. Or, and so we will make choices that risk really terrible things or are willing to cause harm because of a worse harm that we're actually overweighting our certainty on. Right. And so bad epistemics combined with fear of the unknown and a desire for excessive certainty driving instrumental rationality is the name of a lot of well-intentioned evils. Yeah, no. um, and so we have to be careful with that. Daniel, I want to push back on one of the things you said before um, Greg Double G uh, asked you what he did about Nora Bates and warm data. And the pushback is the, the idea that you can actually create images, a model, a process that is not going to involve the emotions. I know you didn't say that it doesn't involve the emotions, the implication of what you said is that you don't want to manipulate people's emotions and that's that's very admirable and you and and that's ethical but what we know about embodied cognition and 4e cognition is that you ain't you don't have cognition without your emotions so one way or the other you're gonna have emotions involved therefore you have to make some choices what type of fruitful um, emotions do you want this to evoke? And if the emotion has to do with the kind of awareness, what I think is an application of what I'm calling cultural intelligence, the ability to discern certain distinctions and how various forces are 
trying to get you involved in their narrative schemes for their purposes and being able to look at that as an object rather than being subject to it, there's gonna be emotions involved. So, I mean, so I think, you know, I, I don't think that's realistic. That's my pushback. I don't think that's realistic at all. So I can, I can try to report on the Amazon rainforest cutting in different motivated ways, where in one way, I want to make it seem like the world is going to come to an end tomorrow if there, if one more piece of rainforest gets cut and that Bolsonaro is doing it out of like baby blood drinking evil. Mm. And I can make an evocative thing that will just make utter horror and outrage. But I can also do the thing that Bolsonaro is doing, which is to show how much fucking jungle there is and the, these few indigenous people in there and then all these poor farmers in Brazil who don't get to actually make any money because all this stuff is protected for no reason that's keeping them from being able to access that land. And I can invoke outrage at the exact opposite thing. So, and both of those are very partial perspectives and evoking certain kinds of responses for, for political reasons. I would like to help make the clearest overview of the thing that we can. It's not unbiased, it's bias corrected by trying to take all the biases, right? By trying to take the various perspectives, trying to inhabit them, trying to see what we can verify or see as true in them. And then also what we can falsify or see as missing, unwarranted or, you know, whatever. Basically a scientific process. I mean, that's an element is the scientific process. Yeah, in earnest, because it's not science in that if I'm asking what someone's perspective is, it's not measurable, it's recordable, right. but it's an earnest endeavor into inquiry. Right. And what I want people to feel is whatever the healthy natural emotion comes from seeing reality is. Maybe mm -hmm. they feel sad, maybe they feel some anger, then hopefully they come to some inspiration or hope or responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. But I want them to feel the real thing that comes from seeing reality clearly, naturally, as opposed to some manipulated emotion that I'm intending them to feel. And then I'm manipulating what I show them to achieve that emotion. I'm not trying to prevent them from emotion. It's okay. just the emotion isn't the outcome I'm seeking so that I am, what I'm seeking is their clarity. And then there is a healthy emotional response to clarity. Mm, beautiful. So you're trying to use third person, I like your term, base reality, to then evoke first person awareness of that base reality. And then that's going to impact second person, we space, uh, intersubjective, interpersonal dynamics in a certain way that hopefully, now this is my, this is my bias. I have a bias towards um, tipping a tipping point. I have a bias towards a uh, a group of people and groups of people who will, as happened in other enlightenments, achieving a certain level of consciousness and culture together, so that their thought, words, and behavior were aligned in a certain way that it can move the entire culture and society forward. That may not be realistic, but I think that with a critical mass, it can happen. Is that something that uh, you can gravitate to, Daniel and, and Zach? I'd like to say something about the previous point with uh, what we've been calling the pedagogical atmospherics of the site, right? That <laughs> the, the longstanding mistake of the kind of like sciences of learning was to commit Descartes fallacy, right? Which is to separate emotion from thinking and to believe that it is emotion that gets in the way of thinking. And, but in fact, it's th thinking doesn't take place in the absence of emotion. It takes place in the presence of the right kind of emotion. Mm -hmm. And so what good teachers do is create these types of emotional environments that are non-coercive. So the experience of the website isn't one of an absence of emotion. It's the experience of not having your emotions manipulated, okay. which is not a non-emotional experience. Right, right, right. <laughs> like, so like if, if you're- It could be a novel you're... emotional experience. It could, this is what I'm, so that's why people like therapists. So Greg probably gets this, like therapists are also able to create a space, uh, ideally, where you have a situation of not 
It's not that there's no emotion. It's that you're not being manipulated emotionally, um, but you are being presented with reality and concepts and, and, and images and other things. And so I think the, the trick ends up being not to make it devoid of emotion as if you can't do anything without emotion, but those, the right emotions to accompany that kind of thinking emerge is what Daniel said. And so, you know, if, um, if you're trying to teach a, a child about moral development and you read them a story that you think should evoke a moral response and it doesn't, like they're just not moved by the, by the heroic gesture of, of ethics, uh, you don't then force them to feel <laughs> something. You, you find a story that resonates them until they're actually moved by the story. And so that question that the teacher knows how to not manipulate your emotion, but get those materials in front of you in such a context that you experience the non-manipulated emergence of emotion. And so this is, again, this deep questions at the basis of what we're doing have to do with non-coercive forms of teacherly authority. And that a subclass of that is non-coercive forms of emotional relation. And so very touchy stuff in postmodern contexts where for the most part, there is no such thing as legitimate teacherly authority. Mm. Uh, and there is no such thing as emotional relation that isn't basically with a downside power dynamic in some, in some way. And so the ability for the therapist to hold more space and give you room to express your emotions is seen as actually potentially manipulative power game, which it is power, but it, it is the power of teacherly authority, which can be granted. And so this is a very, one of the things that is being nuanced in the pedagogical atmospherics is that we are toying with this deeper issue of how can you have something emerge in our culture as it is which becomes a potential focus for a legitimate uh, distribution and dissemination of teacherly authority. And that's one of the main things is the reason teacherly authority fails is because it got localized. <laughs> yeah. And we need to find a way to distribute uh, the teacherly authority. This is something I'm passionate about. Um, and I'll just say quickly, yeah. So from my vantage point, I am working on a broad descriptive systematic metaphysics. Um, and part of that comes from exactly this point. Uh, and that is enlightenment did not produce a coherent metaphysics basically. And part of the postmodern critique, which then seeps into the authority, some of that is glorious in relationship to kinds of authorities that emerge, but some of that undermined the concept of good teacherly authority in a particular type of way. And there are ways I believe to restore that, both in terms of the kinds of process and structures that we engage in at a process level and at an analytic level um, that would bring some clarity. But anyway, I just want to So, so I, I just, oh, one, one, thing, one thing very quickly, Daniel, I promise, and, and Rain, we're, we're gonna be bringing people in shortly. I just wanna say that this process reminds me very much of Ellison and Murray's perspective on the blues. So the blues can be viewed as third person base reality, the reality that as Murray says, um, life is a low down dirty shame. But at the same time, you have to make a choice. Are you going to, and this is gonna be an existentialist riff, are you gonna basically cut your wrist? Or are you going to go out and swing? Are you gonna engage? Are you going to have, what Kenneth Burke called a frame of acceptance f of struggle, of life, of all the things we, or you're gonna have a frame of rejection where you say, well, that's wrong, it's unjust, it shouldn't be that way, mm -hmm. which I think is an immature way of looking at it. Um, so there's some aspects that's in the Black American blues idiom wisdom tradition that aligns very strongly. And I just wanted to voice that, okay. Mm -hmm. I appreciate Daniel, that, please. Oh, mm -hmm. go ahead, Dan. Daniel, go ahead. Yeah, so I wanted to add something. Um, how we are addressing this teacherly authority topic, because we don't have any authority that anyone doesn't grant, and we don't want, like, ultimately, we don't want anyone to trust us and defect on their own sense-making to us. We want people to develop better sense making that they can trust on their own. So how, how we're handling that is, say we do sense making on a particular piece, 
we're we're trying to make sense of what's going on on the India China border or what, whatever it is. So we have the piece, but then we also have how we came up with our sense making on it. Okay. So what data sets did we look at? What epistemics did we apply? What are the other views and what was our sense making on their views? So we actually make our epistemics crystal clear. Mm -hmm. And then we allow people to criticize them. So we can say, if we miss something, if we included some data that was false or we missed some critical data, tell us. If, it, if we find out that you are right, we will publicly update it and credit you if you want that. If not, we'll show the position. So we're not attached to a position, we're attached to the best earnest process we can, we're making it transparent. If you want to take this process, fork it, modify it somewhere else, you can, it's public comments. Sure. And so the goal is to help people develop. So it is developmental, right? It is to help people develop better capacity, but where they get to have full transparency into that process. Mm -hmm. And then the other part I want to say about emotions is insofar as there's an emotion I'd like to induce beyond just the emotion that naturally arises from seeing what there's to see, I think there is a kind of epistemic nihilism that is pretty ubiquitous mm. where people don't feel like they could make sense of what's going on. And so it's hard to make sense of what they should do with their life or how to vote or how to apply their time or anything. And if someone was to have any experience reading where they start to see the possibility that emerges of making better sense of things, that they have a certain kind of epistemic hopefulness start to emerge mm -hmm. an inspiration, not an inspiration in some answer out there, but an inspiration in their own capacity to increase the basis of their agency, which is their capacity to make sense of the world. If there's any emotion specifically that I would hope would come about, it would be that one. That's great. Yeah. Can I interject here? Cause the teacherly authority bit is key. Like one of the signs of legitimate, healthy teacherly authority is that it, is trying to make itself obsolete. Like the good teacher is trying to give you exactly the skills you need to no longer need the teacher. Um, and the good therapist is trying to give you the skills you need to no longer need the therapist. They're not trying to keep you addicted to them as the authority. That's not teaching. That's something else. That's not actually teaching. <laughs> uh, that's just the authority. Uh, and one of the ways to think about propaganda, you'll never actually know all you need to know to replace the propagandist by design. Uh, this is one of the problems with so-called conspiracy theories. Um, but in any case, the, the broader point there is that there are many indices of how do we tell the difference between legitimate and illegitimate teacherly authority? And that is one of them, that it seeks to make itself obsolete. Uh, and so this is precisely what the Consilience Project is seeking to do that, in fact, we're trying to show you under the hood exactly what we're doing. So you can have that sense of being empowered to step into the own, your own sense making. And uh, rather than just having to keep to come to us. Uh, uh, and so I think that's one of the dynamics that you find in the media currently is that like you're addicted to the to the trough, like you go keep going back to eat more of the like high fructose uh, news stuff. And that's just an egregious uh, violation of the obligation that the media has, um, which is to, you, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. So you, you'd like to, in my own words, increase people's sovereignty, not to become rugged individuals, mm -hmm. but to become self-determining in their own sense-making in terms of like what they actually think and feel, not based on the manipulations that are all about them in the media sphere, including advertising and, and PR, but to really take a look at, you know, well, what do I think? What do I believe and why? And that's powerful. I also want to say that that goal of uh, the teacher, you know, teaching the student so that the student goes beyond the teacher, that goes back a long ways, doesn't it? I got that from Dewey. I got that oh. from Dewey because Dewey was like, all right, y'all, you, because people were inspired by Dewey and they made all these crazy schools where they just let the kids do whatever they wanted, basically. It's the absence of teacherly authority in the wake of a very strong critique of teacherly authority, which created chaos and kids who never learned to read or, or, or the, anyway, so he was like, okay, what constraints on freedom are legitimate? He's like, those constraints on freedom are legitimate, which uh, basically set you up for greater freedom 
if you hadn't have had the constraint put on you, right? Cool. So the idea is like, you don't want to allow for freedoms that end up putting the person in a situation to have fewer freedoms, right? So it's about that dynamic uh, and the eventual, uh, you know, graduation <laughs> of the of the student into uh, the lifelong learning journey that the teacher puts them on, um, rather than being locked into a set of ideas, which just holds them the rest of their life. <laughs> and they're basically caged in these ideas. And those ideas come with an identity. And then the, the ego becomes attached to the worldview. And then you're in that place <laughs> where for a long time psychology thought that brains didn't change after the 20s and 25s <laughs> and that people didn't change and in part it was because there was a there was a calcification of the identity and cognitive architecture as a result of i think certain forms of schooling this is we this would be dewey's i'm basically recounting dewey's argument here <laughs> about why we cease to continue to develop and grow so yeah that what that what you learn from your teacher should be um that you can go on to have many teachers uh, and to, to, to move up and out and up and through. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a beauty to that way of thinking about constraint and authority, <laughs> right? That in fact, this is the very stuff of intergenerational transmission and uh, cultures that can exist in perpetuity have figured this out. Um, and we are in a crisis of teacherly authority uh, and intergenerational transmission. Brain. There are some questions, I think. So yeah, maybe we'll go to questions. That'd be great. Yeah. Um, I've got some good questions in the chat. I'm going to jump around a little bit uh, to kind of follow the, the thread we're on. So since we were talking about teacherly authority, Rob Hart has a question, uh, which I'll repost in the chat here. Um, Rob, do you want to ask your question or it, uh, Zach spoke to it a bit? Um, so if you'd like to modify it at all, please go for it. Yeah, I think Zach did start to answer this and I would love to hear him kind of deepen one of the ideas he said about freedom. But the question I originally said was, um, what do you think is the best thing that a teacher can want for the student and the world and use their teacherly authority to produce in the student's journey? Um, and so I, I have really enjoyed your use of the tripartite model. And I've kind of seen each lane of this tripartite model of, of our psychological development as a way that we approach sovereignty or a way that we augment sovereignty in our lives, the sovereignty of sort of the, uh, the, the way that Daniel uses it. And I, I'm curious if that relates to what you mean by freedom. Um, and if the, whole panel could sort of weigh in on what, what they believe to be the highest good that a teacher can seek for the student using their teacherly authority. Uh, I'll begin and I'll try to be brief because I feel like I've spoken a lot. So, so Margaret Mead wrote a book called Culture and Commitment. And in this book, she suggested that there were three kinds of cultures. There were cultures where it never really changed and you were basically gonna inherit what your parents had and their lifestyles and their ideas and things. And in those situations, it was very actually easy to know what as an elder one should teach the youths. It was precisely what they needed to know to do what had been done for centuries, right? Um, and then there's a second form of culture uh, where there is some change, but not that much change um, and enough change where you can actually teach kids to how to expect certain kinds of change. And there, there's a more collaborative relationship. Uh, and this is what the era that Margaret Mead believed she grew up in, right? Um, which was uh, like world wars. Uh, and, but she came to realize that there's a third form of culture where in fact, uh, things begin to change so rapidly that it becomes very, very, very difficult if not impossible for the elders to know what to teach the students. They, that the students will inherit a world that the elders literally do not understand and they become aware of that fact. And so there's a like this weird reversal. And this is actually the root of the root of the youth rebellion and the intergenerational crisis is the fact that this, something like this has occurred and we don't know how to neg negotiate this as educators. Um, but what it means I think is that the educator's responsibility is to allow the student to find the problem that is theirs to work on. It's very vague. <laughs> so you need to allow for enough freedom such that, and enough support 
such that the project that of the the project of their life right the image of their life to get to the meta psychology aspect of it that you're working on who will you be in the future and the elder says i cannot imagine and the youth says now i can because you've given me the resources to imagine right beyond what you're capable of imagining so that's the responsibility it's not to determine for them or to pick out of some slot of jobs that we're <laughs> aware of now or something like that, right? It's actually to give the resources of judgment and discernment, resources of imagination, because we're in that situation um, uh, of not being able to imagine what it will be like for them, those who come after us, who will not be like us, who inherit this world that we've created with its hyper objects and its risks. Um, so yeah, I think that in that sense, that freedom is there. But it's a letting go, which many parents know, <laughs> but which we're having to exercise at an intergenerational level, which is very complex. So that's, uh, I'll leave it there. I'll very quickly say, I think we need to teach young people how to improvise because when you're dealing with double binds and you're dealing with uncertainty, you're gonna have to improvise, but I don't mean winging it. I'm talking like jazz improvisation where you've got to have the chops. You got to have a lot of knowledge. You got to have, you know, a lot of grounding in base reality, in history, in knowing, know thyself and go back to that. Um, because at certain points, you're just going to have to, in the moment, make choices that one hope is, is the wise, spontaneous choice in the improvisation. That's part of a model that, that my wife and I, through the Jazz Leadership Project, we look at improvisation as wise spontaneity. So I would just say that. Um, and for that, you've got to not only support, but you've got to challenge them. You've got to give them structure, but you've got to give them a certain amount of freedom within the structure to express and to experiment and to make mistakes and then learn from those, all of that. So I really think it's a balance of those, of those elements. Hey, let's jump to Tyler Wakefield. You just asked a question that got some plus ones. It's on the topic of education still, but a different angle um, when it comes to the Institute the institutional aspect of the academy. If, if you'd like to ask your question um, and open to Zach or Daniel to respond. Hi, yeah, it, if anyone wants to respond to this, I was just, um, you know, um, we've been talking about, you know, and an, uh, maybe an educational enlightenment, um, but, you know, I'm wondering when a lot of these uh, these processes that are, developed, whether it be journalism or um, other sorts of propaganda come out of, you know, the university structure, people educated within it. Um, I was interested uh, what, um, you know, what's to be made of the academy? Or is, is this a movement that is going to um, exist outside of it? Is that the expectation? Because the institution simply can't be um, repurposed to, to do this type of interdisciplinary thinking? Um, or is this is there an idea that this movement will uh, eventually permeate into um, the academy or is that necessary? Um, I'll just, you know. What a great question that we need about two more hours to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not touching that. I'm not in the academy. So I'm gonna let, uh, let those that are or have more proximity to it to, uh, to answer that, please. Um. Well, I'll, I'll just say I'd like to hear Daniel's take on this. Well, I'll say briefly, as somebody who uh, has two professor parents in the audience even, um, and grew up in the academy, um, my hope is, is that there is a, a zeitgeist of awareness, maybe spurred on by COVID, um, that we are in a major cultural shift um, and that the structures of modernity um, as both terrifying and glorious uh, as they were, I think there is the hope of an increasing conscious awareness uh, that maybe transformation could happen. That's being in some ways very optimistic because I also have a pessimistic side that sees an enormous amount of inertia and static 
um, and stasis. Uh, and indeed, you know, I find myself in these circles now uh, following Jordan Hall and Zach Stein and Daniel Schmachtenberger as opposed to um, my sort of standard academic uh, friends precisely because of the mentalities and the structures that are at place. Um, certainly my own work in the context of America, what I call American psychology, what it became, um, how it was established and what it might become is very much something I'm passionate about. And I believe that if the consciousness raises and the sensibilities that emerge and we start to cultivate a wisdom commons about how to educate folks for the new next generation, um, there may well be a very, very strong impact, a wave of impact across the academy so that they begin to restructure. Um, it's definitely needed and it is my deep hope that that potential might emerge. I'll go ahead and say something and then we let Zach end with it since this is uh, his topic in more depth. I don't think we can consider the restructuring of any of the major institutions in isolation because they are all inter uh, affecting. So obviously if the purpose of schooling is to prepare people for a workforce, then that's a very real constraint. How much of the uh, tax money can actually be invested into the education if most of the people are gonna be laborers? Like what education is relevant to be a laborer? Uh, well, with technological automation, creating a massive amount of job obsolescence in the next while, it, largely in the labor fields, that's both a risk and an opportunity. What could it portend for different kinds of education? So <clears throat> also things like, what is it, what is education in the information singularity post-information singularity when you've got something like 100,000 peer-reviewed journal articles in each field per year come out and there is no such thing as an expert in any domain anymore. And so to be an expert has to be increasingly hyper-specialized microfields, which also means increasingly poor understanding about any of the kind of broad topics. Um, but the broad topics then end up having, those who focus on it have the problem of a lack of the depth where the devil in the details ends up mattering. And so then we start looking at how can the right kinds of computational infrastructure, machine learning, et cetera, not replace, but augment human capacity. And what do we wanna train people to do both when we don't need the people for labor in the same way. And we also don't need the people for all of the compute, but there are things that people are uniquely good at. And it happens to be that the things that they're uniquely good at and that we have intrinsic motivation around largely coincide. So factoring the change in the technological and economic base in association with the educational base is a, the way I would say is the beginning of starting to think about this. And I mean, we definitely don't have the answers. We have a lot of design constraints and some of the answers. And this is why the goal of a cultural enlightenment of more people starting to think deeply about all of the institutions that need restructured and how to do that uh, has to happen. But it's like, okay, well, how do, you, how do you go against the direction of market incentive? Well, the market isn't gonna incentivize anything that goes against the market incentive. Well, the state could, but the state ends up getting captured by the market interest it's supposed to regulate if it's not regulated by the people. So ultimately, if the, if the market incentive is not flowing in the direction that you want comprehensively, where is the change going to come from? It, well, it can't come from the market alone. It can't come from the state that isn't grounded in the people. It actually has to come from culture, which means people valuing something other than what the market currently values enough to reform institutions that can guide market type dynamics. And so the thing we're interested in doing right now is how do you actually even just take the people that are already sympathetic to these ideas and gather them somewhere, which obviously this is one example of sure. provide better education, resource information processing, and the ability to work on these problems in, in more um, collaborative and effective fashion. And I think that is kind of what a cultural enlightenment that ends up leading to the reformation of institutions usually looks like.
I'll say a couple of things. One is that, well, it depends what you mean by academy, because there's at least two things happening. There's higher education, which is sometimes just an extension of high school as a necessary upper stack on the public education system. And then there's the academy where there's something like supposedly ongoing knowledge production, right? And these th two things are often happening in the same so-called university, which is this massive, especially a state school, this massive research uh, complex that is doing both higher education and academics, right? Um, academics being, uh, you know, independent research in the humanities and science, et cetera. Right? So these two things, right? Both of those are in radical crisis right now. COVID really complicated and already debt-ridden higher education complex in the United States. So we're actually, no matter what we do intellectually over here, <laughs> we're looking at a very different higher education coming yeah, in the wave. coming years. Um, higher education, I said higher education. This is about what we do with those people who are exiting high school, right? Uh, the question of what's going to happen to high level knowledge production is also extremely interesting. And this is where we're getting to Daniel's point about computational um, assistance to human judgment at the edge of expertise and a whole bunch of other things that are coming at the academy pretty fast and hard. And the radical de-incentivization of the humanities, like this, that's another crisis <laughs> in higher education is the absence of from a market perspective and even political perspective sometimes uh, doing really solid work in the humanities like ethics and political science and stuff of that nature. So yeah, so I am kind of avoiding answering the question in a concrete way and, say, and saying like there's so much indeterminacy right now in exactly that region that it's not clear. I could see a mass homogenization where you get like 12 big brands of higher education who've consolidated all the little players and you get kind of a centralized, probably state subsidized system. Mm -hmm. uh, but I could also see just a radical fragmentation, wild west, market driven, pseudo higher education um, with pockets of amazing stuff. So I think the, the answer is we'll see, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, um, there's certainly not right now from where I sit, uh, anyone knocking on my door from the academy telling me that there's a groups in the academy organizing around this. Um, I see them hunkering down, trying to preserve the old system and business model, um, which is I think going to fail, so. Thank you. We get Zach. one more. Daniel, yeah. Um, Chris D, I just reposted your question. If you're here, feel free to unmute yourself. Yeah. Hey guys, thank you so much for this conversation. <clears throat> my question has to, and my attention is the Consilience Project challenges legacy media. Legacy media gets a lot better at being ethical and delivering high quality information. So where do you see the best case scenario for the Consilience Project on its impact on legacy media? And how are you gonna deal with backlash from let's say not only the traditional institutions but also the nomadic tribes as well? Thank you. Zach, you wanna go first? You do. All right. This document I wanna write and put on the site, I'm not sure if we will, but I, I like the idea that is called something like predictable responses. <laughs> and it identifies the predictable responses of the various mimetic tribes. And, you know, if you are uh, in the QAnon tribe, you think that uh, this is part of the deep state cabal because somebody in our advisory council's three steps connected to Epstein. If you are part of the woke crew, you think that we are giving voice to racists rather than canceling them by hosting dialectics with people on the right. Um, you know, those kinds of things. And then say, if you had a response arise that was anything like these, and that was, and that you're kind of adjacent to that group, you're not actually thinking you're just a mimetic propagator, right? Like there is a stimulus response process happening in you, and you should be concerned about that. Like you should want to know that you're actually thinking, see if you can come up with a response other than the one predictable by your social sphere. Um, so, <laughs> that's one answer on by the way by the way i could just i could just feel that there were people triggered by what you just said and if not in this group yeah on the video <laughs> you know uh so <laughs> but i mean 
hey, you, you need to get a response. But I, but I wonder, and please don't lose your thought, but I really wonder if huh, another way of going about that is not just the presumption that you should not be caught by a particular narrative, but the steel manning, maybe this is where you, the steel manning is so powerful. If you can voice uh, with integrity, the perspective, and maybe lawyers do this naturally, of others you disagree with, to me, it seems to me that's such an incredibly important step. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty straightforward to argue that the political opponents that you disagree with don't stop existing because you cancel them or because you ignore them or because you call them idiots or terrorists or communists or Islamophobes or whatever it is to dismiss them. They don't stop existing and they don't stop being political actors. And if you polarize them against you, they're also smart and paying attention to what works. And if you win, they reverse engineer the tool that won and use it next time. So if you want to keep driving cultural arms races, keep doing that. But just do the math on where that goes with exponential tech. If you want something other than a cultural arms race, don't be so myopic, temporally myopic, that you think winning this time actually matters very much. And then say, how can we actually, the respect for these humans is actually obligate. There is no way forward on a shared planet without, without getting rid of them and we can't get rid of them. So, you know, how do we, how do we handle that? So yes, you can explain those things. I think actually making the point that I don't think most people want to think of themselves as being more predictable than a GPT-3 algorithm. And yet most of their text speech is more predictable than a GPT-3 algorithm. Most people's text response wouldn't even pass a good Turing test because they're so um, following certain mimetic tropes. And to have people think about that is actually a valuable thing. Now, the mainstream media question. An analogy that I think is an interesting one is it was supposed to be that the market worked by people having demand for things that would actually increase the quality of their life, creating an evolutionary niche for supply, supply would emerge and you'd have competition of who could provide the best product or service, the best price, and then everything gets better. But of course, as soon as supply side is organized and demand side is not organized and it can exert force and to be able to manufacture demand, manufactured demand broke the intelligence of the market, right? And so you can't say, well, let's use demand to change supply because demand isn't coordinated. So it's an asymmetric war and the supply side wins. So sometimes you have to use supply to change demand, to change the rest of supply. And that's what I see that Elon did with Tesla and electric cars. Before Tesla, there just was not a big demand for electric cars. And so he was able to make a car that was interesting enough that demand went up enough that now all the other car companies are making electric cars faster than they would have been otherwise. Our goal is to show what good media could be like, what good news could be like in a way that makes demand for something that doesn't currently exist, that people know that actually creates an incentive for other news organizations to do better news because there's a better educated populace actually demanding it where right now they have an authentic market incentive that's been erased to the bottom because people actually click on the more salacious clickbaity stuff and so we're hoping to be able to educate consumer patterns of media enough that it actually changes the topology of the market to make the supply side have better incentives all right um Rain had to sign off, so I, I'll manage a few more questions as long as we don't maybe do one. Um, I think it was Jason Killinger. Um, is Jason? Yeah, hey. Um, hi, so I asked um, the first, uh, the first, second, and third person development that Daniel, you spoke of, um, that Greg played at the beginning. Um, also speaks, I think, to values. And I'm wondering if while we're waiting, I mean, obviously we have major leaps that we need to um, take in media and in education. And I'm wondering if there's kind of like a fast track 
um, base level that we need to get to that's on that speaks to those around values that if that's like the kind of place we can immediately go. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on 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 that and kind of like movements or people that are that are getting us that are kind of like taking care of that level right now that we can kind of put support behind. I don't know that I understand the question exactly. But uh, I think I understand a part of it. So what are the values that are involved in what we're talking about and what could be done or is already being done on values development work? Oh, I, I, I guess I mean like finding um, finding this coherence like on the basis of values. Like, like a thing that keeps coming up for me is like, um, I keep asking people like, um, do, do you love, where, how far do you extend your circle of care? Like the, those kind of things that I think are, are kind of like a, a ground floor towards like a, you know, cultural enlightenment. Yeah, I think um, the process you're describing of dialogue that looks at things that are shared rather than different first and uh, build some kind of shared life experience, commonality, value, I think super valuable. One thing that we're doing early on is the second person sense making is largely about values. It's a, it's, it's what is, so let's say for instance, I'm, there's some issue where there's a polarization around whether or not this particular proposition should go through. And it seems to be uh, around something that if it does will benefit the economy, but damage the environment. And if it doesn't, the environment will be preserved, but the economics won't get ahead or whatever. So we can identify, well, what are the values independent of the strategy? Fuck proposition A, yes or no. And the values are, I actually want my kids to be able to get a better job. And then the values over here are, I want to have this last little bit of old growth forest protected. When we identify what everybody's values are first, almost everyone can empathize with everyone's values if they aren't bound to a strategy where they're in a theory of trade-offs where valuing your value requires going a particular direction in a proposition that messes up the thing I'm more directly connected to. So can we separate the values that we're seeking to serve from a proposition of how to serve them? then can we all hear everybody's values and then say, is there a proposition that would serve all of them better? That's a key reformation of the democratic process. And it was actually the goal of a town hall and scale just messed it up is before you get into voting on a proposition, was it even a good proposition? Did you do sense-making to help bring that about? And a big part of the sense-making is not just what is, but what are all the things that people care about connected to this? So one of the things when we're sharing different narratives is not just what do different people think is true, but what is it they care about that is ultimately motivating them that can engender the empathy of each other. I really think that's a very, very key shift in move. You know, is foundationally, we do this all the time in therapy. What is the care? What is the value? And how do you hold multiplicity of different values and then look for adaptive synergies across them in some of the solutions? So but that value piece and then empathizing with it, steel manning it, honing it, relating to it is, is a crucial process. I know Forrest has been here and spoke before and he's done the best work I'm aware of on what that democratic like system could be of getting yep. all the values to inform. We're, we're not doing anything that advanced in terms of trying to actually formalize the governance system here. We're trying to actually just at the communication layer, can we even understand the values where other people are coming from? Are we seeking to do that? And in the media pieces we're putting out, um, are we helping make explicit when we steel man the positions, both the partial epistemic truth, but also the values that they're holding? Yeah. Great. I think you said forest. I think you, you're talking about Forrest Landry, correct? Forrest Landry, correct. Yeah, that, that sense making is ultimately an ethical and value laden process that, uh, and this is Habermas's point, ultimately, <laughs> that there's this thing, rationality, which you can do by yourself on a desert island, which is just about manipulating the world. But then there's this thing called reasonableness, <laughs> which is about how reasonable you are, <laughs> and how balanced and comprehensive and how much respect basically you show to those who in who who you're in discourse with. 
And so there's this key base and Daniel said it like, you know, respect for other humans is obligate. <laughs> like uh, not because you'll go to hell or whatever, but because uh, if we keep amplifying the cultural war, we will create a situation of inevitable uh, self-induced extinction. So yeah, there's this base notion of reasonableness rather than rationality, for example. And the reasonable includes the emotional, right? It's unreasonable to exclude emotion, although it could be rational for a little bit of time to exclude emotion, <laughs> but it's completely unreasonable to make continual demands on the exclusion of emotion. So there's a, there's a deep um, basis of values at the root of sense-making. And in my model, of course, you get the ensoulment and, trans and development and transcendence, but you begin with you know, the root of the value of self and other. Yeah. Mm. I like the word justification a lot, but. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's, let's do I, one more. Yeah, I think we have one more question. Uh, yeah. Evan McMullen is, is on deck. If you want to unmute and ask yourself, Evan. All right. Thanks. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Yep. Cool. So this goes back uh, a bit in the conversation to when you were discussing teacherly authority. And so uh, my question has to do with, um, I'll, I'll just read it. So my question says that it seems that one of the thorniest issues related to this issue of teacherly authority is that the fact that most of us were coerced into an educational system where the source of teacherly authority was ultimately not epistemic, but the threat of physical violence and coercion. And so this seems to have created a trauma surrounding the teacher-student dynamic in many, if not most people in our society. And so I wonder if you have any thoughts on how we might address that as individuals, small groups, and uh, as a society at large. I can handle that. Daniel, do you need to run? If you look like you needed to run, like you were bowing out. I can handle this oh, if you need uh, to go. This will be the last question, unless you're interested in what I'm gonna say, but you can probably predict <laughs> it. Uh, the, uh, <clears throat> yeah, you're absolutely correct that in fact, the crisis of teacherly authority we're in um, is not contrived and artificial and um, kind of like made up. <laughs> it's a legitimate crisis of teacherly authority that for a brief period of time, the modern nation state was able to instantiate a form of teacherly authority that was unprecedented just world historically. Um, and this was what Comenius was cooking actually back in the 17th century. And, uh, but that was just a window of time when it could be sustained in America in particular by something like a civic religion where in fact your high school teacher was a potentially inspiring, <laughs> uh, in, like put there by the state who was this admirable thing that you were supposed to so, like, those days are gone. <laughs> like the, the screen won and schools lost. Um, and that was just the nail on the coffin of teacherly authority that had already been degraded um, for a long time, in part because of the inability of the school systems to demonstrate their problem solving capacity, which is to say no child left behind and a few other things, which made it clear to all the students <laughs> that like, this is not working. Like we can tell you adults actually don't know precisely how to run this enormous urban school district in terms of the way you're distributing money and other things. So it became very transparent and the most reflective, intelligent middle school to early high schoolers usually either strategically manipulated the system in order to advance themselves or just cynically checked out essentially. Um, and so that means we're in a situation of having to deal with the downstream consequences of a multi-decade long uh, crisis of teacherly authority in the schools. And so that means people don't, wouldn't recognize good quality teacherly authority if they saw it. And that's why people are actually susceptible to pathological forms like cults and spiritual teachers that are corrupt and things of that nature. Um, so yeah, so I, I don't know how to kind of de-traumatize that, but I do think that um, some of it has to do with those at, uh, pedagogical atmospherics on the site, that there needs to be explicit and clear just how much we're putting in your hands and that we've got nothing under the table or under our sleeves or somebody behind the curtain pulling the strings on us that in fact you are seeing it. Um, and then it's all on the table and you can enter like peers into a relationship. Uh, and that's what every child would have liked to have been able to do um, uh, when they reach a certain age of self-reflection would be able to say, hey, what do I, who do I, and how do I, and they begin to ask their questions and they begin to pursue it instead of being forced to sit in an uncomfortable desk for six hours a day being talked to by a woman who's not smarter than your mom 
<laughs> who's <laughs> only there because her issues paid and you know what I mean? So there you are. Uh, so it's kind of a cynical note Excellent. to end it on. But. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> well, and on that note, no, I, I know you got to go and we're getting near it. Daniel, uh, do you want any offer any sort of summary thoughts or reflective thoughts for us to chew on as we I think I talked plenty. I would just say thank you for uh, having me here for hosting these dialogues. And I hope uh, I hope it was something in here was useful for the people who were here. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Daniel, for coming and, uh, and joining us and sharing. And you also, Zach, and of course, uh, Greg Enriquez, my partner in this endeavor. And we want to thank all of you who have been here sharing in the chat asking questions explicitly, listening in, just being a presence and a part of the field and container that we created. So we want to thank you all. And I want to say that our final session will be next Monday, the 22nd, um, featuring Jordan Hall, uh, Zach Stein again, and Jamie Wheel. And we'll be looking at, uh, once again, the issue of uh, of a commons and hopefully we can get to a wisdom commons. So we hope that folks will share and we'll uh, also come back. Amen. Thank you, Greg. Thank you guys Thank you. so much for everyone okay. for coming and sharing that. Really appreciate it. Thank All you. righty. Thanks everybody. Take mm -hmm. care.